I'm always really aware that I don't do YouTube as efficiently or as optimally as I could do. Like, I know there are so many things that I could put in the title or like shove in the thumbnail that would get me so many more views and I never do it. So for example, the last video I made, which was about my like post uni plans, I know I could have called it something like, did I pass my degree or you know, something along those lines with a big clickbaity thumbnail of me going like, and today's video, I could have very easily called it something like how I got into Oxford and Cambridge, but I never do it. And the reason for that is I really hate clickbait. I seriously don't like it. And I know technically it's not clickbait, right? Because all of those things are true. But it's still, I don't know, like sensational thumbnails and titles to me kind of feel like the tabloids of YouTube. And I really don't want my channel to be like that. But the other reason specifically in terms of today's video, the reason why I'm not calling it how I got into XYZ Uni is because I've never really liked those kind of videos. I've always thought that you never know if you got in because of something you did or in spite of it. So for example, the thing that we're springs to mind is personal statement advice. You could have done something in your personal statement and got an offer and then you think you've got an offer because you did that in your personal statement and you make a YouTube video and you tell lots of people about it and they start copying you. When in actual fact, like what if the admission tutor looked at your application and thought your personal statement was absolutely awful and the only reason why they gave you an offer was because the rest of your application like redeemed it? I don't know. I hope that makes sense. So today's video is very much not going to be how I got into a certain uni because I don't know how I got in, right? When you get into a uni, all you get is an email or a letter saying congrats, you have a place. You don't get an email dissecting your application telling you what impressed them and what really didn't. So instead, I'm just going to talk you through kind of, I guess, my process of applying. I think it's going to be a really short video, but I just wanted to say if you've got any questions, there's anything I didn't cover, ask me and I'll keep the comments of this one active. I try and reply to everyone anyway, but I think that will work a lot better than me just chatting for ages, I hope. <laughs> so if you're not watching my last video, something that's probably important is the unis I applied to and the courses I got offers for. So I only applied to two universities and two courses this year and that wasn't because I thought I was definitely going to get in, it was because I had a backup plan already which was to spend my fourth year at Lancaster and to graduate with an MPhys instead of leaving after three years with a bachelor's. So the two courses I applied for were, the first one was at Cambridge and it was the MAST, which is the Master of Advanced Studies in Mathematics. And within that, I was thinking about specialising in theoretical physics, so the same thing I did from undergrad. And the other one was the MSc in Mathematical and Theoretical Physics at Oxford. And that's the one I chose in the end because they gave me a pretty substantial scholarship. Also, in case you don't know, I did my undergrad at Lancaster. I have a BSc in Theoretical Physics. It's really weird to be able to say I have the BSc, by the way. I've still not got over that. And I got a first class in that. So the first thing I think I should probably talk about applying to Oxford and Cambridge is that it's nothing like the process of applying for undergrad. So at undergrad, I believe you apply directly to the college, right? And then they decide if you get in. Postgrad, nothing like that. So you apply to the department. Then basically the department decide if they want you or not. If the department want you, they forward your application to kind of like the graduate admissions bit of the uni. And if they decide, yeah, the department's made the right choice, you then have an offer. And as soon as you've got that offer, you've definitely got into the uni. But the different thing compared to undergrad is you don't have a college yet. So kind of all the application stuff is done centrally. And once you've got your offer, they then start sorting you out of college. And if you've got an offer, you definitely have a college. It's just not clear which one it will be yet. I hope that makes sense. There are some interviews, my courses, neither of them interviews. This is the kind of thing that you'll find when you start researching courses, which is something I'd recommend doing now. So it's actually been a huge rush trying to make this video on time. I've got a load of other stuff I need to be doing, but the reason why I made it now is because this is the kind of time that I really think people should start looking at the courses. If you're thinking about applying for next year, it's the kind of time that I was definitely looking and starting to kind of put things together. So the first thing you want to do is you'll want to go on the course page on the website. So on the course pages, one of the most important things you need to look at are the entrance requirements and there are two things you should be looking at so the first thing is obviously the grade are you on track to receive the kind of grade that they're asking for and the second thing you should look at is is your degree the right one if you're not sure that might be worth emailing them to check because the thing is there's no point applying for a master's even if you've got an amazing grade in your subject, if it's not like closely related enough, you're probably not gonna get an offer because you haven't ha got the right background. Obviously this is very dependent on the course, but specifically for the ones I applied for, I know one of the things I had to kind of prove in my application was that I did have a sufficiently strong kind of mathematical background and that my undergrad degree did cover the right kind of content for me to be able to cope with the masters. So the thing is, if you probably don't fulfill the entrance requirements, I would say there's not much point in applying because one of the, 
awful, awful things about Oxford and Cambridge at postgrad is that they charge a lot for admissions, which is ridiculous, right? For a uni that's trying to prove that it's more inclusive and whatever. But I can't remember which way round it is. I'll try and like edit that in here. But I know that one of the universities charged me £50 for the application and the other one charged me £75. And that's a hell of a lot of money. One of the things you might want to look into if you're thinking about applying is whether your career service have any kind of like bursaries for applications. I know Lancaster's do. The other things that you want to look at on the course page, obviously you want to look at the course content and see if it's actually something you want to do, but assuming yes it is, I would look at whether it is gathered field or rolling admissions. So the difference between the two is gathered field will have a deadline and they will not look at anyone's applications until that deadline has passed. So if the deadline's in March, it doesn't matter if you apply in October or if you apply, you know, a couple of days before the deadline, it makes no difference. No one's going to look at your application until March anyway. With rolling admissions, the way it works is they kind of look at them as they come in and that doesn't mean they give offers out as they come in. And there are plenty of people that apply near the deadline and still end up with offers anyway. But if it's rolling admissions, you probably do want to have your act together and apply a little bit sooner than if it's gathered field. So until the application's actually open and you can see the portal, you're probably not going to be able to see what you're going to need to do and provide for the application. The things you can start preparing now are making sure you've got a copy of your transcript, which has got all your grades on, and making sure you know how you get hold of that from your uni. And the other thing is references. So it should say on the course page how many references you need, and now might be a good time to start thinking about who you want to ask and also asking them because obviously if it's in the summer holidays they're going to be a lot less busy than when term starts when everyone else is going to start bombarding them too. So my Oxford application and my Cambridge application were subtly different in that Oxford wanted a personal statement and Cambridge wanted you to fill in some answers to some questions. I essentially ended up writing a very similar thing for both things but obviously it was structured different because in Oxford I just had this page of a personal statement and in Cambridge I'd answered I think there were three questions. So in answering those questions I said all the stuff I'd said in the personal statement anyway but it was broken down into chunks. The personal statement was probably the bit of the application I found hardest and it's very different to undergrad by the way the personal statement. I found some really useful advice on writing personal statements for postgrads which again I'll link below. The other thing I would say, the only thing I would say actually, is properly properly research the course before you start writing the personal statement because postgrad personal statements versus undergrad are pretty much all about writing why you want to do the course and which bits of the course you're interested in. So I found it so much easier to write my personal statement when I basically researched the courses to death. So I looked at the course handbooks, I looked at other people's reviews, I looked at the module pages, so I really knew what I was getting into. And then it made it so much easier to explain why I wanted to do this course when I knew exactly what the course was. The other thing I had to provide as part of my application was a CV. So again, I'll link the help that I found on the internet for CVs below. But the thing I'd say is I completely started from scratch compared to the CV I use for like uh, internships and also a CV I use for kind of like part-time jobs because it's kind of proving a very different thing, right? You're applying for a course, not a job. The way I set about writing mine was just I kind of wrote down all of the things on just a scrap sheet of paper that I wanted to evidence in my CV and then worked from there. I got help from two places at uni for my CV. So the first bit of help, which was probably the most helpful in terms of the content, was from actually within the physics department because those people knew a lot better about the actual course content and what I've done in my undergrad. And then basically when I knew what I wanted to say, I then went to our careers service and they helped me with the formatting and the wording and stuff like that. But yes, I found a lot of like resources that kind of like helped me know what I was doing because I had absolutely no clue at first. So I'll put those in the description in case they help you. So the other thing with Oxford and Cambridge, like I said, is you do have a college as a postgrad. It's very different to undergrad though in that the college basically has nothing at all to do about whether or not you get into the uni. The college is sorted out after you have a uni place and the college can still reject you, but if they do reject you, you just get passed around until someone else adopts you. <laughs> there are basically two main types of college that you're able to apply to. So the first one is a mixed college of undergrads and postgrads, and the second option is postgrad only colleges. And then there are loads of other things as well. So there are colleges I know at Cambridge that are for mature students, which I think counts as over 21s. And there are some colleges that are for women only too. So I think the biggest decision you have to make is do you want to be in a postgrad college or do you want to be in one that's got a mixture of undergrads and postgrads? So for me, this was a really easy decision to make actually, because I don't really think of myself as being a postgrad. The course I'm doing is a weird course because it's only a one year master's. So it's kind of a cross between an undergrad and a postgrad anyway. And I knew because I was only going to be there for a year. I mean, it'd be different if I was doing a PhD, but I just knew that I wanted to be in a mixed undergrad and postgrad college. So that was an easy choice for me. I also knew I wanted to be in a mixed gender college. I just 
have never really done single gender stuff in my life. Like I've always been in scouts rather than guys. I went to a mixed secondary school, you know. Something that I didn't realise until I started uh, really seriously researching colleges and something that you might want to be aware of is if you want to be in a mixed college with undergrads and postgrads, a lot of the time you're not gonna be able to live in college accommodation because the colleges prioritise their undergrads and it will be their undergrads that have the rooms on site. It's very rare at both Oxford and Cambridge that a college will have their postgrads actually on site. And when I was in Lancaster, in second and third year, I lived out in Lancaster rather than on campus and I loved it, right? I would not have wanted to live on campus again, but because I was only gonna be at Oxford slash Cambridge for a year, I knew I wanted to be in a college just so I had like a bigger chance of making friends and could kind of make the most of it. So my kind of college decisions ended up being very much swayed by that. So at Cambridge, you could put a first choice and a second choice. And for my first choice, I picked Trinity because they put their postgrads on on site and they've got a lot of money, a uh, lot of scholarships and stuff for math students. And for my second choice I put Selwyn just because it looked like a really nice college. And at Oxford I put my first choice as Keeble because they have, they don't put their postgrads in the old college site but they have a second separate new college site kind of right next to the old buildings of Keeble which is where all the postgrads go so it's kind of like, I thought it had the advantages of both being a mixed undergrad and postgrad college and a postgrad only college because I'm not going to have to live with freshers. But yeah, it's still very difficult choosing a college as a postgrad because all of the information on the internet is all about undergrads. I would just say be very careful if you want to live with other people from the college about where their accommodation is because a lot of the colleges have their postgrad accommodation in uh, houses dotted all about the city, miles apart from each other, which, you know, might be fine for some of you, but I knew it wasn't what I wanted. Right, and the final thing is scholarships. So the way you apply for scholarships at Oxford and Cambridge is um, very easy, actually. For both of them, it was just kind of a case of ticking a box and saying that you wanted to be considered. And then at Cambridge, for some of them, you had to write a separate personal statement as well. There are different types of scholarships at both unis. So there are the central university awarded ones, and there are also ones that colleges specifically award. A lot of the scholarships, like I said, you're just considered automatically if you tick this box on your application form. Some of the college ones specifically you have to apply for separately, but there's a scholarship searcher tool for both unis, which I'll put below. So honestly, like just have a look around. Some of the conditions of them are really, really specific as well. So if you fulfill them, you've got a really high chance of getting them. The one I got, by the way, was just a college awarded one for merit, and it was for the mathematical, physical, and life sciences. Right, so I think that's everything I wanted to talk about. I'm just going to check, because I asked on Instagram if anyone had any questions. All right, so to quickly answer some questions for Instagram, one I got was, do masters accept two ones, or is it strictly first class honours? Completely depends on the course. Uh, if you have a look on the course website, it should tell you. One of them says, do your A-level grades count towards applying? No, there's nowhere on the forms where they ask for your A-level grades. If you want to put them in, which I did because mine were good, so I thought, why not? I put them on my CV, but you absolutely don't have to. I think most people probably wouldn't. How early to apply? So I would say start getting your application sorted as soon as possible. And if it's rolling admission, so if they give out offers as they go, you probably want to get your application in as soon as possible. If it's gathered field admissions, as long as you apply by the deadline, you're completely fine. Do you think there's discrimination on different physics courses from the stronger unis for postgrad? I'm not sure I entirely know what you mean, but if you mean uh, does the type of physics undergrad you do affect whether or not you're going to get an offer, um, I think it would in the sense that I did my undergrad in theoretical physics and I was applying for theoretical physics postgrads, so obviously I've had a more specialist education, I guess. But I mean, not everyone offers different physics degrees, so it's probably more the modules you've taken, to be honest, than the name of your degree. Why did I decide to do a master's rather than go straight to a PhD? Because going to a straight to a PhD is very, very unusual in physics, particularly in theoretical physics. Why didn't you stay in Lancaster? I've explained that in my last video. It definitely, definitely wasn't that I wanted to leave Lancaster. I love Lancaster a lot and I'm very sad to be going. What do I plan to specify in? A mixture of theoretical particle physics and theoretical condensed matter physics at the moment. If you're on an integrated MPhys course, does the process change if applying elsewhere? Um, so, basically, the way Lancaster does it, which I know is not the same as all unis, but basically up to third year, whether you're doing the four-year course or the three-year course, everything is exactly the same. So you can literally get to the end of third year and decide, right, that's it, I want to get a BSc, even if you're already on the MPhys course. So I applied when I was on the MPhys course, and in my application I basically said I would drop down to the bachelor's if I got an offer. 
And then obviously I did end up with offers, so then I told Lancaster I'd like to switch down to the BSC. But if I hadn't have got offers, I would have just stayed on the MFAs. I hope that makes sense. But I know a lot of people for both the course at Cambridge that I got the offer for and the course at Oxford that I got the offer for do the full four years at their undergrad uni first and then apply for the postgrad afterwards. I just didn't see much point in doing a second master's, particularly financially. And what made me choose Keeble? So I absolutely adore Keeble. I think it's a really lovely college. I like the fact that it wasn't too small. And like I said, I like the fact that it actually has its postgrads on the college not on the main college site but on another college site so you, I feel like they're more included in the college I like the ethos of it it was set up to make the uni more inclusive in the Victorian times and also uh, I really like how it looks so I know this kind of divides opinions and some people think it looks like lasagna which I don't see as being an insult anyway lasagna is great but I like the fact that it's different to the rest of Oxford <laughs> it's not your kind of like standard creamy building and also it's in a really convenient location because I don't know if you've ever been to Oxford but Keeble's literally in between physics and maths so and I think that's everything. Like I said, I've probably not covered everything, so if you've got any questions, ask me below. And I think the main point of this video is just going to be the links that I'll shove in the description. I hope it's been in some way helpful, and I will see you in another video. Please give me suggestions, I don't really know what to make. <laughs>